Hello, and welcome to the National Association of Plant Breeders webinar series, How to Breed New Plant Varieties, Imagining and Engineering Crops. My name is Maria Carrizales, and I will be serving as your host today. This is a special presentation presented by Dr. Walter D. Young of Cornell University. His research centers around the genetic improvement of potato, both by conventional and molecular means. His breeding program aims to develop new chipping and table stock varieties that are adapted to the Northeast. The title of his presentation is Get the Dirt on Potato Breeding. And now I'm going to switch control over of the screen to our speaker. Well, hello, welcome everybody. I'm glad you could join me today. Um, today I'd like to talk to you about my perspective on potato breeding. Um, my talk today is divided into three parts. Um, in the first part, I'll be presenting an overview of various attributes of potatoes. Uh, in the second part, I will delve into various traits of potatoes that we consider when breeding. And then in the third part, we'll get down to the nitty gritty of how all that stuff's combined to develop new potato varieties. So uh, potato, um, Solanum tuberosum, the cultivated potato, unlike the other um, crops that are been described so far in this webinar series is an auto tetraploid. Um, the base number of chromosomes in potato is 12, so cultivated potato has 48 chromosomes. There are also cultivated diploid potatoes, um, which are not very widely grown, only exist pretty much in a few places in South America. Um, but there are lots of diploid wild potato species. An interesting difference between diploid potatoes and cultivated potatoes is that diploid potatoes are almost invariably self-incompatible, but that self-incompatibility, um, the gametophytic self-incompatibility breaks down when you double the chromosome number. So it's possible to self-cultivate um, potatoes, but we typically don't do that um, in a breeding program because potato suffers from pretty serious inbreeding depression. Potatoes are, I think as everybody knows, um, vegetative vegetatively propagated, so a potato variety is actually a clone. All the plants are um, in a variety are genetically identical. The clonal propagation, the autotetraploidy, and the high, letter, high level of heterozygosity that characterize potato um, have some pretty significant impacts on how new varieties, new potato varieties are developed, which we'll eventually get to. In the picture here, you can see some potato flowers. Making crosses in potato is quite easy. Um, the flowers are, are complete. If you'd like to get um, pollen, you can put a small tube, like an Eppendorf tube, over the, the anther cone and shape, vibrate the back with an electric toothbrush. You'll get lots of pollen and transferring it to the um, exposed um, stigma at the center of the flowers on the female plant is pretty straightforward, too. Potatoes were domesticated seven to 10,000 years ago um, in the Andes in the area around Lake Titicaca, which is situated at the border of modern day Bolivia uh, and Peru. The elevation of Lake Titicaca is quite high. It's about 3,800 meters above sea level. So um, this is obviously a rather cool environment and thus potatoes um, originated as a cool weather crop. In most of the world, potatoes are grown rather cool locations closer to the poles than to the equator, but are also grown in the highlands. And because there's so much genetic variation in potato, potato has also been bred um, to tolerate um, higher heat than where it was originally domesticated. Since domestication, um, there have been two um, probably key developments that have changed domesticated potatoes compared to wild um, potatoes. Um, the first was that uh, over time, early domesticators selected for potatoes that had reduced glycoalkaloid content. Glycoalkaloids are toxic and bitter compounds that you've probably all tasted if you've ever bitten into a, a chunk of potato that had some green tissue in it. When you expose potatoes to light, um, it induces chlorophyll to form. That's not a problem. But also induces glycoalkaloids to form, and that's what imparts the, um, the bitter flavor. Wild potatoes invariably have high levels of glycoalkaloids, but cultivated potatoes um, have very low levels. And a second important um, 
a change that happened to potatoes during domestication, at least in the past 400 years since potatoes left um, the Andes and have moved around um, the rest of the world, is that they have been selected for the ability to tuberize under long days. So in the United States, potato production is pretty widely distributed. I guess that every single state produces at least some potatoes, but the heaviest concentration of potato production is in the Pacific Northwest, where Idaho, Washington, and Oregon um, produce the bulk of the nation's potatoes. There were about 1.1 uh, million acres of potatoes planted in 2012 with an average yield of about 40,000 pounds per acre. So potato is quite a, a high yielding crop. As someone who's located in New York State, I can't help but point out that 100 years ago, New York actually grew more potatoes than Idaho does today. But potato production has moved uh, over the past century to the West Coast because the growing seasons are longer um, and the availability of water uh, and, and large tracts of land have facilitated potato production, it made it easier uh, in the Northwest than it is in the Northeast. On a global basis, this map shows where potatoes are, um, uh, are grown to any meaningful scale. And you can see, in addition to North America, there's high concentrations, uh, high, high amounts of potatoes produced in Europe, India, and China. India and China are relatively recent um, additions to potato production. And they're now the number two and number one nations in producing potatoes, um, respectively. It's quite a re remarkable change that's happened just over the past few decades. And it's also remarkable to see how widely potatoes are grown on the planet today, given that 400 years ago you could only find them in South America. They've spread very quickly and very widely in a short period of time. In terms of market classes, there are basically three classes of potatoes. Potatoes uh, in the top right hand corner here that are intended for making French fries. This is a photograph of Russet Burbank, probably the most famous potato variety in the world. On um, the bottom left are some potatoes that are intended for making potato chips, and the bottom right are happen to be some fresh market um, potatoes. Um, key difference between French fry and chip potatoes is shape. French fry potatoes need to be long to make long French fries. Chip potatoes are generally round. Fresh market potatoes can come in just about any shape or color that you can imagine. Um, as long as they're pretty and taste good, it's OK. So now we'll shift gears and, and talk about what kind of traits potato breeders consider when they're developing uh, new potato varieties. This slide shows uh, a whole bunch of traits that I won't elaborate on now because the next few slides show photographs of uh, a lot of these and I elaborate on them more then. Um, I'll just point out two things when looking at a, a long list of traits in potato. First of all, I've divided these traits into quality traits, um, disease resistance traits, and, and, and general traits, and would say that in developed nations like the US, the emphasis in breeding tends to be on quality traits and, and not so much for disease resistance because we typically have chemicals that can control um, a lot of the diseases. In developing nations, the cost of pesticides or the availability of pesticides uh, isn't very good. Um, and so the emphasis shifts towards disease resistance relative to the other traits. The other thing that I'll mention um, in the slides, uh, still on the screen, is that and, and something I'll elaborate on later is that potato breeding is essentially the art of balancing these and a whole bunch of more other traits all at the same time. So high starch content is something that's important for both French fry and chipping potatoes. Um, it's an essential attribute for both of those market classes. And it's important because potatoes need to have um, high starch for processing um, because the higher the starch, the less oil that's absorbed during frying. Oil, in addition to not being so healthy, is also quite expensive. Breeding programs don't typically measure starch directly, but measure starch content indirectly by measuring um, tuber density. So in, in the picture here is the method that my breeding program still uses um, 
which we put eight pounds of potatoes in a basket, attach it to a, a hydrometer, and then um, um, let it go and see how deep the scale sinks into the water. The deeper it sinks, the higher the starch content. Another way of doing this is um, to take an arbitrary amount of potatoes and weigh it in air and weigh it in water and calculate density and thus starch content that way. Another really important attribute in processing potatoes, both chip and french fry, um, is fry color. So consumers, for the most part, prefer potatoes after they're fried to be relatively light um, in color for both potato chips and french fries. Dark brown chips or fries also have somewhat of a bitter taste in addition to not looking so appealing. The compounds that are primarily responsible for the brown color are glucose and fructose. So if a potato has a high amount of those sugars, um, it will turn dry. brown during frying. It's, it's just simply a, a Maillard reaction. The, the issue arises when you want to store potatoes in the cold. So potatoes that you harvest in September and want to store all the way through April and make potato chips and french fries along the way. It's that potatoes, when they're stored in the cold, um, tend to accumulate glucose and fructose. And so for the past few decades, there have been intensive efforts in my breeding program as well as just about every other um, developed nation breeding program to develop potatoes that accumulate less glucose and fructose um, when they're stored in the cold compared to potatoes that um, were developed prior to several decades ago. Shallow eyes tend to be uh, an important attribute for all market classes, um, primarily because it's just a pain to peel potatoes where the eyes are deep. Um, the eyes on this potato, um, Ozette, uh, aren't particularly deep, but it would, you could imagine it would be a nuisance to, to peel. For processing, um, the deeper the eyes, the deeper you have to peel to eliminate them, and of course, thus the waste, wastage in, in your home kitchen, no one wants to spend a lot of time carving around eyes. So selection against deep eyes is something that's common to all potato breeding programs. Hundreds or thousands of years ago, deep eyes was actually a beneficial trait in potato because it helped to protect young sprouts um, from breaking off before tubers could be planted. So I've already made the comment before that in many ways, chip potatoes and um, french fry potatoes share a lot in common. The primary difference is, is shape. So in common, um, potatoes that are developed for these markets have to have high starch and accumulate low sugars in the cold. Um, the ideal shape for a french fry potato, not that you can achieve it, would be a brick because then you would get the maximum yield of french fries um, for a given, a given volume. The ideal shape for a chip potato would be a baseball. Round chips um, work better in automated, automated slicing and packing operations and a, a round potato allows you to uh, maximize the inner volume to well, minimize the amount of wastage due to peeling. And so you get more product per um, pound of input potatoes. For, for fresh market uh, potatoes there's considerable emphasis on tuber appearance. Um, where tuber appearance is really a composite of how smooth the skin is or how even the russeting is, if it's a russet potato you're trying to develop, how shallow the eyes are, how attractive the color and shape are. Uh, I often like to say that the top three traits in developing fresh market potatoes are looks, looks, and looks. Uh, it's kind of appalling in some ways, but the reality is that um, most of us buy vegetables based on appearance, and uh, that includes buying fresh potatoes. And so uh, in order for a new potato, a fresh potato variety to have any chance in the marketplace, it has to look pretty in addition to having any other attributes you'd like it to have. Another trait that's important in developing fresh market potatoes is to ensure that they don't disintegrate extensively after boiling or turn gray. So every year we boil dozens of potatoes that we're considering for release as uh, fresh market clones to see um, whether or not they fall apart. And in this picture you can see a few potatoes, like this one where my cursor is, that have disintegrated upon boiling. That's okay for a chipping potato, but it's not kosher for uh, a fresh market potato. And I don't have any really good examples in this photo of how gray potatoes can turn after boiling, but those that turn considerably gray 
after boiling, um, we also just dis discard from consideration. Diseases, of course, impact um, plant breeding no matter what plant you're working with. In potato, the big three diseases worldwide, in my estimation, are late blight viruses and cyst nematodes, which I'll discuss briefly here. Um, th this photograph shows um, a potato field. Uh, I think it was perhaps about two weeks after late blight had moved in. And it's just a close up of some vines on the ground, and you can see that, no surprise, late blight completely wipes out potato, and it does so in a very short time frame. From a breeding perspective, there have been a lot of R genes that have been introgressed into potato over the years. Um, this was particularly prevalent activity uh, in the mid-1900s or so, but it turns out that every one of the R genes that has been introgressed into potato um, uh, eventually, and for that matter, typically quickly um, broke down, um, and so its, it's use usefulness was, was lost. At the moment, the only good options for controlling late blight are either to spray chemicals regularly, which we do in, in the U.S., or to try to work with polygenic um, resistance, which doesn't break down so easily, but does reduce the degrees of freedom you have for um, incorporating other traits um, into the final cultivar. Potato viruses, viruses are a, a pernicious pest um, worldwide. Potato virus Y and potato leaf roll are both um, transmitted by insect vectors and can uh, easily spread. If you have infection of a potato plant during the season that it's being grown, the yield reduction isn't so great. The problem really arises in what happens when you plant an infected tuber the following year. And that's sort of illustrated here in a, in a trial I once observed where um, obviously the potatoes in the center of this picture were heavily infested with the virus and the, the yield wasn't going to be um, particularly good at all compared to some of the potatoes you see at the margins where the virus levels weren't so high. The good news from a breeding standpoint at least is that there is a single dominant gene, the RY gene, that um, has proven very effective against PVY and it doesn't seem to have broken down yet. So we can control PVY if we have to. If you um, include the RY gene uh, in your breeding efforts. Globally, cyst nematodes are also a really serious problem in potatoes. Um, the issue being that when they're present and allowed to build up to high enough levels, they dramatically reduce yield 80, 90 percent or more. In this picture um, are some cysts of the, the golden cyst nematode, which is found in New York State. These cysts actually represent the female, um, the bodies of the, the female nematode, and when the female dies, um, it leaves behind a cyst with several hundred eggs in it. One of the really nasty aspects of cyst nematodes is that um, they can survive in the soil for 30 or more years. So once you get them, they're almost impossible to um, eliminate. In the U.S., we have the golden cyst nematode in New York and a close relative, the pale cyst nematode uh, in Idaho. Um, and there are considerable efforts um, to contain the spread of both of these. In New York, the, one of the ways that we've kept um, the golden nematode from spreading for the past 50 years is to develop a lot of golden cyst nematode resistant varieties. If you have this pest in your land, you're required to grow um, um, resistant varieties as part of a rotation to keep the levels down and to keep it from spreading further. And indeed, in New York, cyst nematode is pretty much not spread um, meaningfully in the past 50 plus years. Another attribute or disease, I should say, that, that concerns me um, in New York and is also of concern in, in many other breeding programs is common scab, which is caused by a prokaryotic organism, Streptomyces scabies, where the real issue arises when um, potato is so susceptible that it reacts to its common scab by forming deep pits. The deep pits um, make the potatoes pretty much unmarketable uh, as fresh market produce and from a processing standpoint requires so much peeling to remove them that um, they're not worth using for processing either. So in my program and I expect any other program that worries about common scab 
we eliminate clones which um, are prone to pitting. And of course, prefer clones which don't react at all, um, but uh, are willing to tolerate um, clones where there is just some surface scab that can be easily peeled off if the potato is destined for processing. There are very few chemical control options for common scab. You can spend a few hundred bucks an acre fumigating with tear gas. Uh, but other than that, I don't know that anything else can be done. So the, the best means to control it remains um, resistance. One of the interesting things in potato um, compared to other crops is that yield really hasn't changed that much over 100 plus years of potato breeding. So the cultivars that were developed 100 years ago, the best yielding ones, yield pretty much the same as the best yielding cultivars today. Um, I've often e experienced a reaction from grad students and breeders of other crops of sort of disbelief that this could be the case in potato, wondering how it is that we could spend so much time breeding and not improving yield. Um, I guess my answer to that pretty much amounts to um, calories per acre that potato produces still dramatically um, outstrips that of wheat, rice, and maize. So uh, it's not us who has the problem with yield um, to date. Um, in any case, potato clearly yields well enough that um, we can focus our uh, attention on other, uh, on other attributes. And so in practice, what it amounts to in a potato breeding program is that we are um, aiming to develop new cultivars which yield comparable to existing cultivars. Uh, in my own program, if it doesn't yield, uh, a candidate cultivar doesn't yield 90% of the, the variety Atlantic, which is a common Czech variety, we'll discard it. But 90% are better, and, and we'll c keep considering it. Uh, there are a couple of physical defects that we're constantly selecting against when we're conducting potato breeding. Um, one's pictured on the left here, which actually shows two symptoms together, and that's potatoes that have a propensity to develop hollow heart and potatoes that have a propensity to develop brown centers or the brown center doesn't become hollow. Clearly, either one is not particularly desirable, not the kind of thing you want to find when you cut open a potato at home. Um, another um, common defect that varieties differ for in terms of susceptibility are growth cracks, which are pictured on the right. Growth cracks typically occur when a potato has been subjected to a bit of drought stress and then suddenly gets a, a lot of water. The tuber expands rapidly. Some cultivars um, crack much more readily under these conditions than others, and we select against those whenever we see it. Uh, another thing that um, I'm constantly battling with in my own program um, is acceptable maturity. So we'd like the vines to die um, by the time the growing season is done or die a little bit um, before that. Or if they, because if they don't, um, tubers will cling to immature vines, which makes mechanical harvest or hand harvest difficult, if not um, impossible. So um, I, I mentioned before that and this is sort of connected to the topic of um, uh, adaptation to, to long days. Um, whenever you make a cross with a wild species, you'll find that they um, mature very late. Uh, and you have to fight, fight this battle of bringing your material back to acceptable, acceptable maturity. This picture is one that reminds me of an experience I had very early uh, as a breeder at Cornell. I, I requested some potatoes from Idaho for making crosses, and my predecessor said, you know, the growing seasons out there is much longer than in New York. You're going to get some really late vines. It's going to cause you problems. Um, I ignored and made the crosses anyway, and this is actually the field where you see that my predecessor was right. Um, you, you see a lot of green vines here at the time we dug the potatoes, and this made harvest a pain. Anything where you still see green vines at harvest time would pretty much eliminate. Okay, moving on to um, the third part, um, sort of how we consider all these traits simultaneously in, in, in potato breeding. Pictured here are some potato fruit which look unsurprisingly a lot like tomato fruit and typically have a few hundred seeds in them. So in theory, potato breeding is remarkably simple. I mean, basically you identify two parents that have complementary traits and then you cross them, assuming they flower, that is. 
uh, and then once you've we've crossed them, you spend a dozen years sifting through the F1 that you just generated, um, in which are clonally propagated throughout the evaluation, to determine if any of the varieties, any of these these new genotypes, merit release as a new cultivar. There is no extensive back crossing or um, any complicated breeding scheme. It's just make a cross and, and sift through the F1. I mean, conceptually, you can think of it that you know. Um, when you make a cross, you've essentially created candidate new varieties. Each seed is a, is a distinct genotype, and one of those seeds might be a new variety. Um, it just takes a long time to sift through all the seeds to, to figure out which, if any, um, merit release as a new variety. So I just said that it typically takes about a dozen years after making a cross to get a new variety. And a question I'm asked so often is, why is potato breeding so slow? And the answer to that, I guess, has three parts. Um, the first part is, is that it takes about four to five years to produce enough tubers for when you start from true seed in order to do any meaningful yield trial or other large-scale testing. So if you plant a single seed in the soil, you get four or five tubers. You plant those, and you get five to tenfold as many tubers in the following year and so on. So the multiplication rates in the five to tenfold range each year. So it takes a few years to get stuff for testing. Um, pictured on the right here, um, I guess a bit of an aside, something that occupies an awful lot of time in a potato breeding program is cutting seed and preparing it for planting um, because it's clonally propagated uh, and, and our propagules are large. We have to have a lot of space for storing potatoes and we have to spend a lot of time cutting them and bagging them and getting them ready for, for next year's planting. When you cut potatoes, of course, you can spread diseases. Um, um, the worst would be viruses. Well, one of the worst would be viruses. We soak our knives in lime, which you can picture, see here on the right, um, in between cutting seed lots, so we're not spreading viruses between um, between clones. Okay, so you spent four to five years moving from having a single seed to having a, enough seed for testing in yield trials. Um, the next thing, the next reason that breeding is so slow is then you have to spend three, four, or five years uh, evaluating potatoes to make sure that the few that you're still evaluating perform consistently. There's really no shortcut for this. Um, it's useless to release a cultivar that yields well three years out of four and is a bust in the fourth year because then the grower is going to go bankrupt. Um, when we release something, we have to be confident that it's going to yield reasonably well year after year after year. And the only way to test to know that is to have tested it in a large number of locations uh, for a large number of years. No, no shortcuts here. Okay, so maybe at this point we're up to uh, eight or nine or ten years that a clone's been in the pipeline. Um, then the last thing that you have to realize that what makes potato breeding so slow is that once we've identified something as good, we have to remove any viruses that may have accumulated or other diseases um, and, and basically begin the seed multiplication process all over again. So at Cornell, um, I have a, a counterpart here, Keith Perry, who runs the New York State um, foundation seed farm, I send him potatoes that I would like to have virus removed from because I think it might be a, a new variety. It'll take him perhaps a year to, to ensure that um, any viruses that are present are eliminated. And then from a single in vitro plantlet, um, multiplication um, can begin. And that takes a few years until you have commercial quantities of seed available um, for a variety to be sold. So it's sort of a sum of those three reasons that it takes potato breeding so long. Moving from a true potato seed to enough material for for testing, then lots of years of testing to make sure a clone can perform consistently, and then finally, the whole process of seed multiplication again. In terms of numbers and scales, this slide illustrates a typical progression through the Cornell breeding program, where every year we make well, 50 to 200 crosses. And then um, in the subsequent year, we take seeds from those crosses uh, and plant in the ballpark of 20 to 30,000 seedlings, uh, depending on the funding we have uh, at the time by seedlings. So these are plants that originated from true potato seed, and they produce tubers. Um, and then um, in all subsequent years, we you know, plant tubers harvested from the previous year's um, um, plots um, for testing and seed multiplication the, the, the f in subsequent years. 
So when you plant true potato seed in pots, um, it's really hard to get a meaningful assessment of clone performance. So we don't select very hard on the um, offspring that, that are growing in pots. We typically keep about 80% of, of the seedlings and plant those in the field the following year. We plant f in New York four tubers from about 20,000 clones uh, each year. And then the way the scheme works is that each year we look at less and less and less clones, but the plot sizes of the clones we're looking at get bigger and bigger and bigger. By having larger plot sizes, we can do more and more tests. We can send the seed to more and more sites for uh, evaluation in addition to our own um, evaluation. My clone, my program happens to be very interested in developing chipping varieties. So um, after the first year the potatoes have been in the field and we reduce the original 25,000 down to about 2,000. We make potato chips out of all of those clones to see which ones chip well, which ones don't. We also care a lot about gold nematode resistance, and so we test stuff once we're down to 200 or so clones and test clones every year that they remain in the program thereafter to make sure they truly are gold nematode resistant. If it's a chipping clone, we make chips from them every year thereafter too to make sure we have a good idea of how consistent the chipping ability is. So, oops, I may have gone two slides. This is a, I did, go back. This shows um, this potato seedlings. Um, you can see there's e each of the cells in these speedling trays contains um, a different potato genotype that originated from a, a true potato seed. We translate, translate, we transplant the seedlings that grow in these speedling trays into um, larger pots shown here and grow them outdoors where you can see some indication of some uh, irrigation setup surrounding surrounding these beds. At the end of the year we harvest four tubers out of these pots and as I've already said we don't um, practice strong selection at this stage because the performance of potato plants in pots doesn't really reflect what happens in the field. And here you can see some of the tubers that we harvested from pots um, we harvest four tubers from each pot for planting subsequently, or fewer tubers if that's what we've got. And then in the following year, um, we plant four potatoes in a row. If we're planting white potatoes, we'll plant four hills of white potato, a couple of red potatoes to indicate um, that's the end of a plot, a new plot begins, some more hills of a white potato, a red, a red marker potato, the white potato, and so on. Um, down the field, and the colors are reversed if we're looking at, at reds, where we use white spacers. Uh, in the early generations, where we're looking at such high numbers of potatoes, um, we have to make selection decisions based on a very quick um, visual assessment of yield and appearance. You, you can't dilly-dally if you're looking at 20,000 individuals trying to decide which ones you'd like. You just have to take a quick look, make a decision, um, and, and move on. In later years, as our plot sizes increase and we have more and more potatoes available for testing and more and more data available about how a clone performs, um, the selection process is much more considered and typically takes place you know, with a spreadsheet in front of us um, in discussions amongst those of us who, are, uh, who work in the breeding program. And so this is just a photograph of uh, some of our fields. And you can see here the plot sizes are larger. So uh, th these represent clones that are much more advanced in our breeding program. Um, in terms of scale, my program plants potatoes on anywhere between 5 and 10 hectares of, of land each year. We're not actually limited by the amount of land we have available in my program. But what we're really limited is by how much cold storage space we have. So because potatoes are large, um, um, we, we bring a lot of uh, biological material back to campus each year and have to store it somewhere and we only have so much storage space that we can keep potatoes in. So it limits the size of my program again is, um, is storage space and not land. A feature you might notice in this pig figure is that we plant potatoes, two rows of potatoes and have an empty row in between them. Um, in the empty row, um, we deliberately leave so we can walk the potato fields during the year looking for plants that are infected with virus. If we ever see plants that are infected with virus, and of course we do, we pull them out um, so that they don't give rise to daughter tubers that can serve as a source of inoculum. 
the following year. So um, I have often encountered the attitude in graduate students and breeders of other crops that the primary challenge in potato breeding is the fact that it's autotetraploid. And it's true that autotetraploid genetics are much more complex than diploid genetics, but from where I sit, um, having been a potato breeder for 14 years now, I don't consider the autotetraploid nature of potato to be the primary limitation in making progress. Rather, it's really the high degree of heterozygosity that potato has. So we now know from, from sequence data that potato has a single nucleotide polymorphism every 20 bases or so on average. Um, and what this means is, is that every time you make a cross, thousands uh, of loci are segregating. I mean, you'd have an explosion of genetic variation every time you make a cross. And so really what's tricky in potato breeding um, isn't the autotetraploid genetics, it's balancing all of the segregation that you unleash every time you make a cross. And it's weighing the many strengths and the many weaknesses that each clone possesses to identify something that's better than current varieties. And um, this really amounts to being at least as much art uh, as it is science, deciding when something really is better, given the combination of traits. And you can think back to that list of traits I had before. No potato is ever perfect. It has some strengths and it has some weaknesses. And um, the ability to, to discern what's truly better um, is really what separates the potato breeders who are successful from those who aren't. Um, on this vein, um, we have an annual event in New York called Potato Show and Tell that was started by my predecessor um, and I've continued. It's been running for a few decades where I stand up and talk about, uh, in the middle of all these potato crates, the dozen or so potato clones that are currently the most advanced in our program and that what we would like industry feedback on. So I try to do my best to summarize objectively as I can, the strengths and weaknesses of the potatoes that we're evaluating and get feedback from people who grow potatoes, who, are, who run potato chip factories, on whether or not they consider a particular clone to be um, something we should release as a new variety or whether we should maybe just keep evaluating it or that we should eliminate entirely from the program. So this, the business of balancing the strengths and weaknesses isn't something that you can just leave to the breeder of potatoes. It, wor it works best when you interact frequently with your stakeholders to get their feedback too. And I probably will, probably one of the most important lessons I've learned uh, as a potato breeder over the years is that you can ask growers or industry representatives what they'd like in potatoes and they can always come up with a list. But in practice what they want does not always reflect what they've listed as priorities on their list. Um, there are unique combinations of traits, strengths, and weaknesses that they like uh, and don't like. And it's only by having discussions about concrete potatoes with concrete combinations of strengths and weaknesses that you can really begin to discern what they're most interested in and, and you know what they'd like to see in new potatoes. It's a, a linear list doesn't really cut it. Now I've said that I don't consider auto polyploidy to be the primary problem in potato breeding, but I have to acknowledge that it is an issue in cases where there is a des desirable recessive allele that you'd like to work with in your program, but it's only present at a relatively low frequency in your germplasm or in potato germplasm as a whole. So it's not such a big deal to, in a diploid inbreeding tolerant crop to fix for a recessive locus. Um, it's, much more of a nuisance in auto tetraploid potato, particularly for alleles that are present at low frequency. So uh, even if you've managed to drive the frequency of a recessive allele up to say 50%, so maybe you have some potatoes that are duplex for recessive allele and you can have a cross where you know, two, one parent has two copies of the recessive allele and the other parent has two copies of the recessive allele. If you cross that, those two parents together, only 1 36th of the offspring are going to be homozygous recessive. Um, and the chances that those offspring have the other attributes you'd like in the potato, you know, not so high. Or another way of looking at it is um, you got to throw away 35 out of 36 potatoes before even weighing the traits. So um, 
this is a, a big headache if you're considering working with recessive alleles, and for the most part, I personally am not interested in it. And there's a second related consequence to this. Let's say you know, you've actually taken all the effort and you've fixed a, a low-frequency recessive allele in some clone and it's successful as a variety. If someone else wants to use it as a parent, um, you know, and, and it's truly a low-frequency allele, another germplasm, none of the offspring are going to have, are going to be fixed for that, or homozygous recessive when you make the cross. Um, you'll be fighting that battle all over again with the vast majority of offspring, if not all of them, not being homozygous recessive. Um, I find a couple slides changing gears and talking about um, um, biotechnology. So, of course, you know, molecular markers have had a profound impact on, on the breeding of some crops. I guess soybean and maize particularly come to mind as, as, as well as wheat. Uh, at the moment, molecular markers are not yet widely used in potato. Um, this is too a large, this is primarily due to the fact that very few good markers have yet been developed. The resources, the genomic resources and the, the size of the, commu the research community in, in, engaged in potatoes is less than that of um, many other crops, even though potato, uh, from a food standpoint, is the third most important food crop in the world. Um, there just hasn't been so much research. That's part of the problem. Um, well, actually, that's pretty much the problem. Um, there are, nevertheless, a few good markers, um, two that I use routinely in my own program, are markers that are linked to PVY resistance and gold nematode resistance to simplify the identification of, of plants that have those traits. Um, I, I have to say, though, that how you will use markers in a potato breeding program is a little bit tricky because just because you can identify a plant as having a trait um, by use of a marker doesn't mean you'll necessarily want to keep that plant in your program. Again. In the end, you have to weigh a lot of traits, uh, and um, knowing that early on that a plant, you know, is or is not resistant to PVY may not be relevant for you if PVY resistance is not a make or break trait in your program. Um, because potato is uh, is clonally propagated, and you know, we spend a lot of time developing a cultivar, fixing a, a new combination of alleles. And, you know, it's often easy to think of situations where, you know, this potato variety is perfect, but I wish it had just one more trait. Um, potato happens to be easy to transform. Um, and so, if you know the gene that you've preferred that trait, you can improve potatoes by adding that gene, it's quite simply. So, at, at the moment, genetically modified potatoes are not accepted um, actually anywhere uh, in the world, although that could change in the uh, in the near future. There were genetically modified potatoes um, in the late 1990s that Monsanto had. They were pulled from the market in 2000. And, and since then, um, with the exception of a brief experiment in Europe, which has since ended, they haven't been grown anywhere. Simplot, a company in Idaho, was seeking to change that um, by putting potato genes back into potatoes and hoping for more consumer acceptance. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But in any case, in principle, because potatoes are easy to transform genetic engineering of potatoes is sort of an attractive option for breeding um, if we ever reach the point where they are accepted. In a similar vein, if genome editing using um, CRISPR or Talon um, technologies ever becomes efficient, then uh, similarly I would expect that potato breeding will rapidly change um, because if you just like to change swap out an, an allele in a potato, replace it with something different to give it the trait you'd like, um, that would be exactly what you'd like to do. Again, it, uh, breeders have spent a long time compiling those um, allelic combinations and varieties that do become successful and because when you make a cross it all segregates again, it's, just, it's often more appealing to think about editing what you have rather than shuffling the dice. And my point. Okay, so I guess that's all I really wanted to say on um, genetic engineering. And this is the last slide. If you're interested to learn more about potato breeding and genetics, I guess the book I'd most recommend um, would be Potato Genetics by uh, edited by Bradshaw and, and Mackay. It, it discovers many aspects, discusses many aspects of breeding and genetics. And even though it's somewhat old, I still consider it a classic.
if you'd like to learn more about um, potatoes per se rather than um, genetics, the complete book of potatoes, a book published a few years ago with my father, a colleague of mine, and authors is something I'd, I'd recommend. And that, I believe, concludes what I want to say. And with that, I want to thank you again for joining us, Walter, and thank you all to our audience for coming.